Many thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. You know, you often hear folks talking about over-editing this photo, perhaps over-editing that photo, but you seldom hear anyone mention any struggles related to under-editing. And I'm not sure if under-editing is even a term, it could just be something that I made up, or perhaps it's something that only I really struggle with. But I can attest to the fact that under-editing has been a much bigger long-term issue for myself personally, as opposed to that of over-editing. Now, I think for beginners and those just getting started, over-editing, that probably is the bigger issue. But as you progress, I found that recognizing when you're over-editing is substantially easier to identify and saw for than that of under-editing. And that's the purpose of this week's video, is to discuss five signs that you just may be under-editing your landscape photos. So to jump right into it, of course I rated these in order of importance, so under-editing under sign number one is hands down the most egregious of them all. So coming in at number five is something that I simply call loose crops. And this happens to me a lot. What's interesting about this one is it's kind of like a, it's kind of got a, uh, it's time released a little bit to where you capture an image, you bring it home, you edit it, you, you post it somewhere. And then a couple months later, you start to review it again. And you decide that, that you want to do things a little bit differently. And I think this is a great example right here. This is an image from a Hawaii from a couple years ago. And I, I really like the photograph. I liked how there's this kind of tree line of a tree, tree line of vegetation. And I'm not even sure what all this is, but it creates this nice leading line that kind of wraps around the corner here to where the waterfall is in the center. And I, and I really love that about the photograph. That was the main reason I took it. But there's just so much going on in the background here. The sky is not very interesting. There's all these little houses here. This was a distraction over here. There's these little um, red trucks over here that were also a distraction. And you can see the original crop I did. I just really just straightened up the horizon. But I decided to play with it a little bit. And I ended up going with something that more in line resembles this. And I found this to be a much more focused image. Your eye really doesn't have anywhere else to bounce except to really follow this tree line up into the waterfall right here. And your eye doesn't just get distracted to looking at the boring background or the boring sky, or your eye doesn't get pulled to those buildings on the right side of the image, which is way too close to the edge anyway. This seemed to be just a much more focused crop. So I really liked the way this one turned out. And I ended up using, this was the, uh, the final crop that I ended up going with. And here's another good example, also from uh, from Kauai, where you can see how I how I composed it. I used the rule of thirds. I put the horizon exactly on the, the top line. I put the lighthouse in the top left-hand corner, but it just felt a little bit imbalanced. It felt like the image was just kind of leaning more towards one way versus the other. And it was just too much negative space over here, and the sky wasn't interesting enough to, to, to warrant leaving this much negative space on the right side. So I ended up bringing it in some, and I believe it was right about here, something to that effect. And I like this overall image much better because I feel like this amount of land on this side is uh, equal to the amount of water on this side, and it just made the overall image feel a little bit more balanced. So this overall photograph, or this, car this crop, felt better composed, I should say, than the original crop. So just paying attention to those loose crops and just making sure to see if there's any other way that you could possibly crop your photos to just make a little bit more focused of a composition. Now coming in at number number four is something that I simply call flat colors. And this happens a lot, especially if you're shooting in raw, because when you get the raw files, they all lack contrast, they lack colors, and you kind of kind of add that back in. But understanding exactly when you're not adding enough in is, uh, is uh, definitely something that, that I struggle with. And here's an example of an image from Oregon. This is uh, already has some editing done to it. This is the raw file right here, and you can see how just it's an overcast day, and the colors in this image are very flat and very dull. So I added a little bit of vibrance, I added a little bit of saturation, which I really don't do a whole lot of. And if you're not familiar with what the difference between vibrance and saturation is, saturation is basically a global adjustment. It's going to impact all colors in your image the same way. Vibrance is a little bit more sophisticated of a version of saturation where vibrance is going to impact the less muted or the more muted colors of your image more. So basically it's gonna target those duller colors in your photograph a little bit more where saturation just targets everything the same way. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove the saturation. I'm gonna bring the vibrance down just a little bit to maybe around plus 15 and I think that's a good starting point. 
I'm gonna close that down and I'm gonna come down to the camera calibration section. And the calibration section is usually where I start off when I wanna to start to uh, impact colors. So I'm gonna come over here to the shadows and I always like to rock all these sliders back and forth just to see what they're doing. And I like a little bit of magenta, I think, in the shadows of this one. So I'm gonna leave that there. I'm gonna bring the, shift the red hue more towards orange. Kind of go back and forth. Maybe to about there looks good. And then the saturation, let's bring the saturation up to maybe right around there looks good. Let's come down to the green primary. I'm gonna shift the greens over to maybe right around there looks good. And then the saturation, um, do a slight boost on the green saturation channel. I think that looks good right there. And then the blue primary, this is my probably my, one of my favorite ones to play with. It impacts images a lot. So, and of course it depends on the specific image, but it's really making a difference on this one. And I'm gonna bring the hue, I think, down more towards aqua. So maybe around minus 10, I think that looks good. And then the saturation, let's bring this up to maybe about right there. And let's toggle this section on and off. So this is before and after, before and after. So that already made a big difference. And after I go ahead and, and make my adjustments in the calibration section, that's when I go up to the HSL panel. So I'm gonna close this down, come up here to HSL. And I always like to start with saturation. So I wanna increase the, uh, the oranges here. I'm going to do in the hue section and then luminance. Luminance is one of my favorites. You can really see what you can do. You can almost create a, a false sense that light is actually hitting certain surfaces because luminance basically increases the brightness value of colors. So by just kind of rocking this back and forth. So I'm going to bring this to maybe around there looks good and then yellow let's see what that's doing as well that looks good let's bring that up to maybe about right there looks good and then green and see what that's doing to the greens is in the image and we'll bring that up quite a bit i think that looks good and let's go ahead and just toggle the entire effect on and off from from where we started with the the raw file to where we're at right now so this is raw this is before any adjustments and this is after. So before and after. So that made a massive difference, but just paying attention to those flat colors and not being kind of not being worried about increasing the colors too much. Of course, you can always go back and change them, but I usually try to go for a more muted color palette in most of my photographs, but what happens a lot of times is uh, I underdo it and I just make my colors just look a little bit flat and boring sometimes. So that's something that is kind of an under editing issue for me as well. Now, coming in at number three is something that I call muddy shadows. This doesn't happen too terribly often, but when it does happen, it can absolutely ruin a photograph where you have just an area of your image that has, is just, it has a lot of dark, shadowy, just, it looks like a mess, just kind of like a muddy, shadowy area. And here's a great example right here where there's this, this, this blob of shadow right here. And I could just come up here to the basic panel and just crank the shadows all the way up. And that actually made that area look a little bit better. Or let me just hit Command Z and hit the radio filter and just draw a radius right around this tree. Make it a little bit bigger, kind of tighten it up some. I'm going to invert it here. I'm going to drop this down to exposure. And you can see what that already did. It already brightened this area up. And I think the real trick in these kind of situations is you obviously don't want to bring out all the detail in the shadows. You want the shadows to be a little bit dark, but you want to be able to see some level of detail so it just doesn't look like a blob of darkness in your overall photograph. So I'm going to come over here to Range Mask and select Luminance. I'm going to hold down the Option key and I'm going to drag this from the right side over here. And anything that is in white is going to receive the edit and anything that is in black is not going to receive the edit. So that made a slightly better, more refined mask right through there because pretty much this entire region right through here is shadow. And then I'm going to go ahead and crank up the exposure some. And you really got to bring it up a lot because the mask is very refined. Maybe bring the shadows up a little bit as well. 
add a little bit of contrast in there because bringing up the shadows and the exposure sucked a lot of that contrast out of that area. And then let's toggle this on and off and just kind of pay attention to this area here. So this is before and after. Before and after, and that was probably overdone just a little bit, but I wanted to make sure you could easily see it at home. Kind of bring this down a little bit and toggle this before and after. So that is just a great way to resolve those areas, those kind of muddy shadow areas. Like I said, it doesn't happen too terribly often, but it can really ruin a photograph when, and that image was a perfect example. I love that overall photograph, but I could not stop looking at that, that just blob of shadow right through there. So creating a local adjustment using a luminous, luminance range mask is a great way to solve those. Now coming in at number two is something that I call dim light. And this is one of my, I wasn't sure whether to put this one at number two or number one, but this is something that I really struggle with. And I mentioned this trick in a video, uh, I think a, a month or so ago, but this really helps me out. This image I think is a great example because the histogram looks good. Everything's kind of piled up in the center right here. It looks properly exposed, but you know, I had to dial in negative exposure. And then I kind of, if I wanted to, to bring it up a little bit, if we hold on the shift key and double click exposure, you can see that Lightroom is saying that this is what the actual exposure level should be. But then I started to look at that and I was like, I'm not 100% sure if that's correct either. So here's a quick tip and this helps me out a lot. I'm gonna change this to one to eight to where there's a lot of uh, working space around the overall photograph. I'm gonna right click on the background and I'm gonna change this to white. And I'm just gonna take a minute and just kind of look at this photograph and, and let my eyes adjust to it because this is just a great way to, to determine whether or not your photo really is underexposed, maybe it's overexposed or it's properly exposed. So just kind of staring at this for just a few seconds and then right click on the background again and switch it to black. And this is a great way to just help you determine exactly whether or not your image is properly exposed or not. And now I'm thinking that it is a little bit underexposed. I'm gonna bring it up a little bit, right click, switch it back to dark gray, which is usually where I am at, take this back to fit. And I think that this is a much more properly exposed image, but shifting that background color to white first and then black, that's something that really helps me out as well. And here's another good example. So I'm gonna change this to one to eight again. Let's right click, change this to white and just let my eyes just kind of look at that. And this is the area right through here that really bugged me because this area is, is pretty dark. It's a deep shadow right through here, and this is dark through here. And then you've got this area right through here that's really, really bright. So I really struggled with this overall exposure. And now that I've looked at it for a second or two, switch it to black, and just kind of look at it again. And now it kind of helps me to realize that that image definitely is a little bit underexposed. Let me hold down the shift key and double click exposure to see what Lightroom is indicating. And it's indicating almost a half stop of exposure, uh, positive exposure for this image. So I'm gonna shift this back to dark gray, bring it to fit. And I think that actually looks better than that right there. So just shifting that background color to white and then the black, just let your eyes kind of adjust and then make your final, determin final determination as to what you think the exposure should be. Now for the hands down, number one, or most egregious of all the under editing signs that at least plague my post-processing workflow is something that I call contrast deficit. And I still struggle with this mightily almost on every single photograph. And I've, I think I figured out a pretty good tip to resolve it though. So here's an image. And when you first look at it, I think, I mean, I think it looks great. This is Yosemite Falls, a classic shot. But the more I look at it, it is lacking contrast. So I could kind of bring up global contrast here a little bit. We can come down here to the tone curve just for uh, time purposes. I'll just use one of uh, Lightroom's presets. We'll put medium contrast on there. And I think that does look good there. But what I like to do is hold down the command option or command comma key, and that will make a virtual copy. And then I'm gonna change this to strong contrast. I'm gonna hold down command and comma key once again, make one more virtual copy and then shift this back to linear. And then I'm gonna come up here to library, go back to my grid of all my photographs here, and I'm going to right click all of these and hit this little compare button right here. So you can see that this one right here is substantially darker than this one right here. And if we go back over to the other one, this is the original one right here. 
So I'm thinking that this one right here, this is the medium contrast. I think this one looks better because the strong contrast, it just looked too dark right through here. You couldn't see any of the details and we would kind of run into the, uh, the muddy shadow situation there. So I think medium contrast looks good for this one right here. And I've got another great example here where same thing, hit the develop module. You can see that there's already some contrast applied. Let's go ahead and hit command comma, create a virtual copy, medium contrast, command comma. I'm on a Mac, by the way, change this to strong contrast and then come back up here to the library module and then compare these three and to see exactly which one we like best. So this is the original image. This is the medium contrast. And then this is the strong contrast. And for this one, actually, I think I might like the medium contrast one right here the best, which is, I'm sorry, the strong contrast. That's this one right here. This is the medium. And then this is the, uh, the flat. Yeah, I think this one is the best. So Using the virtual copy function, I think, in Lightroom is absolutely critical. I'll find out what the shortcut key is for, for PC, and I'll put it on the screen here as well. But using those shortcut keys is a great way to just make rapid fire uh, virtual copies and just make those subtle contrast adjustments to really help your eye to figure out exactly what contrast adjustment is best for your particular image. So that's the number one um, under editing issue that I have is contrast deficit. So before I do wrap up this week's video though, I hope you did enjoy it. And I do wanna say a big thanks again to the sponsor of this week's video, which is Squarespace, who I use for, for literally all of my website needs. Squarespace provides a dynamic and attractive online platform to create your website. You can display your photography using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs and customize the layout and look and feel of your gallery in order to make it your own. With Squarespace's traffic overview feature, you can track trends and page visits and views to better optimize your content. You can even grow and engage with your customers with Squarespace email campaign tools, which enables you to create engaging emails that match your website with your products, blog posts, and logo, just so your messaging remains consistent. So if you are looking to start a new website or possibly upgrade your current website, check out squarespace.com forward slash Mark Denny for a free trial and 10% off your first purchase. So I do hope this week's video was some, um, some helpful information that you could apply to your post-processing workflow moving forward. Like I said at the beginning of the video, under editing is not something that I hear talked about very often, uh, ever really. And I started to think about it and I found out that there was a, a lot of things that uh, negatively impact my post-processing workflow that definitely fall into that under editing bucket. So as always, thank you so much for watching this week's video. If you did enjoy it, if you could, hit that thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already, ring the notification bell just so you are notified when I do post a video. And as always, thank you so much and I'll see you all next Wednesday. Bye.